Most of us are totally unaware of what actually goes on in the teaching environment of today's classroom. Our guest today spent 17 years as a science teacher in state schools in England and Wales, similar to our public schools in the U.S. He uses his experience to bring to light the secular way of thinking that is so pervasive in our public schools. Coming up next on today's edition of Origins, Truth, Lies, and Science Education, Part 1, with Paul Taylor. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Origins. My name's Don Chapman, and it's my privilege to be your host. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science, along with other important facts that validate the truth of creation and the accuracy of God's Word. Today's guest is Paul Taylor, and he's been speaking on creation and apologetics for over 35 years. He has taught science in the public school system in United Kingdom for nearly 20 years, and he's worked in ministries such as Answers in Genesis and Creation Today. It's so good to have you with us, Paul. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful. And we're going to talk today, you have a background in education. We're going to talk about truth, lies, and science education. I think you'll bring a unique perspective to that. Well, the thing about this uh, particular title, it's really based on a thought that came out of England's national curriculum. Now, I actually had some involvement in this. In the uh, 1980s, um, the then government was trying to work on uh, uh, put, putting together a national curriculum that would lay down standards for the entire country. And uh, I was part of a focus group that, uh, that looked at that. And there was one interesting clause that they came up with, uh, which said that pupils should be taught ways in which scientific work may be affected by the context in which it takes place, and then they gave examples. They said, for example, social, historical, moral, and spiritual. So I spent some time researching what was meant by the spiritual implications of science and how do you actually teach them? Yeah. See, this was an interesting concept. And uh, it's, it's a phrase that's been removed from the national curriculum since, but correspondence with government ministers uh, suggested that they still believed that it was there, that they, they said there was... Now, they may not mean exactly the same as I mean by the word spiritual, but they felt that there was a spiritual dimension to science. Uh, uh, even uh, my old sparring partner, Richard Dawkins, talks about uh, having an awe about science. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so there is this aspect of, of science that uh, students need to understand. And of course, as creationists, we really believe there's a spiritual dimension to science. Yes. It declares the glory of God. Yes. The problem that I saw was that the background to science education in the Western world, in Britain, and as I see now in the United States too, often takes a worldview which is not necessarily biblical. And it's that that causes the problems. That's where the lies part comes in, if you like. So after I had done my research on this particular subject, um, my supervisor at uh, the University of Cardiff suggested that I put together a sort of more popular level book on the subject. And I gave it the title Truth, Lies and Science Education for that reason. But uh, I think a lot of people these days are quite worried about what their children are learning in schools without really being able to put their finger on exactly what it is. There's an uneasiness, but they can't really define it. That's right. Yeah. And I think that's important. I mean, if I gave you an example um, of the sort of things that children are being taught, this comes from the English education system. And uh, I, I've, since I've lived and worked in the United States, I've been pulling examples from uh, various different state education systems too. This particular work actually comes from a year two lesson. We're talking about children who are six years old. Now, right. please bear that in mind. These are little children. So it goes, fossils in the rock, pterodactyl teeth, millions of years made an ammonite. Yeah. Okay, now this is the interesting part. What do these children go home thinking? Do they go home? These are six-year-old children, so do they go home to their parents 
uh, you know, Dad asks, you, asks uh, little Jenny, what have you been learning in school today? And she says, well, we've been learning about the motifs in uh, Sanson's uh, Carnival of the Animals, particularly his work Fossils, how he repeated a motif from his earlier work, Dance Macabre. Does little six-year-old Jenny say that, or does no. she come in singing, millions of years made an Ammonite? Yes. It's the latter, isn't it? It is. So they are being taught something, to sing something over and over again that puts that in their heads, and we know that that's not even true. It's so, a worldview that's already been planted. Yes, what do you call it when small children, six years old, are made to repeat something over and over again that's not true? Mm -hmm. We call it indoctrination. That's right. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I don't think for one minute this teacher thought that she was trying to indoctrinate people by producing this piece of work, but she comes from a worldview that hasn't thought this through. She's not a science teacher, and uh, she's, she's trying to do what she thinks is the best. Sure. But we need to understand that everything a teacher does has an influence. You know, the first school that I taught in was honest enough to say in its staff handbook that it has a hidden curriculum. But I believe all schools have a hidden curriculum. The, the staff handbook said, uh, the, the, the parents handbook rather, said the school has a hidden curriculum which is the background to everything we teach. This hidden curriculum consists of the teacher's standards and principles in line with the ethos of the school. Now that's true. Every school has a hidden curriculum. When a child goes into a math lesson, they're not just learning times tables and algebra. What does the teacher say? If I ask a question, put your hand up. There's a moral standard being taught. It may be trivial, but everything that's being taught in that lesson has a hidden meaning. They're not simply being taught math in math lessons. They're being sure taught enough. morality. Yeah. And if there is a problem with the morality of the school on a deeper level, then that is going to be taught to the children. And parents need to be aware of that. You know, uh, the Apostle Paul said to uh, uh, Timothy, he said, guard what was committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. You see, there is an educational principle here. Paul is very much Timothy's teacher, isn't he? Um, to, uh, Paul, Paul was Timothy's mentor. And he's saying, guard what was committed to your trust. Well, what was committed to his trust? Paul didn't give him a set of jewelry or something. What was it Paul gave him? It was, truth. yeah, it was the truth. It was the teaching. And therefore, what we teach to the next generation is a commitment of trust. The Bible, I believe, has a very important point to make biblically about education. And we need to be aware of what the Bible says about education. There are some very important principles. One example is in Proverbs, where we read, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. And um, in a sense, there's a slight difference of emphasis between the idea of teaching and the idea of training. Because training is telling us, well, you follow the example. It's not just what the things that you write down in your notebook of the facts and so on. And too many teachers that I've come across, colleagues of mine in the past when I was a teacher, would say, well, my private life is my own business. I think that's standard fare yeah. today, yeah. Yeah, but actually it isn't. Well, it is and it isn't. There are certain things, obviously, you know, pupils do not need to know the address of their teacher and, the, uh, and things like that. But nevertheless, what the teacher believes privately will come out in what they do. Absolutely. And the children will imitate the teacher, or alternatively, the children will do the opposite of the teacher. But one way or the other, what they believe and what, they, what comes across in their mannerisms and their attitudes has an influence and the children are being trained. But this is directed to us. We're told to train up a child in the way he should go. So then the question is, who is responsible for this? And I believe that the Bible is very clear about who is ultimately responsible. This is what we read in the book of Deuteronomy. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hands, shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Who is responsible biblically for the education of our children? And the answer is, it is the parents. Their own parents. And it has to be done by time spent with them. 
Absolutely. laying on the couch with them, taking a walk with them. You're teaching not just when you're having a class, but all the time. Absolutely, and yeah. that's, I think, what this passage is bringing out, that's because right. it's, it's what you do all the time. It says here, when you're walking, by the way, that's right. take your kids for a walk. <laughs> And you're teaching them. But, you know, it is perfectly acceptable to delegate responsibilities to someone you trust. Sure. And this is where a school comes in, because you may decide that you're going to delegate the responsibility to a school. But the question is, do you trust them? And you need to be aware of this. Do you know exactly what your children are being taught, what moral standards are being taught in the school? And if you don't, why not? My children all went through the public school system, in fact, but I spent a lot of time debriefing them at the dinner table in the evening. And, you know, this brings me really to what I consider to be the saddest verse in the Bible. Oh. And uh, I, th I think, it's, well, it's one of the saddest verses in the Bible. You know, I'm using perhaps a bit of preacher's rhetoric there, but one of the saddest verses in the Bible is this one. It's in the book of Judges. In the book of Judges, we read, The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. That's good. But here's the sad verse. Yeah. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord nor the work which he had done for Israel. Why did another generation, the next generation, why did they not know the Lord? Well, they'd failed at uh, Deuteronomy 6, hadn't they? As, that's what I believe. Yes. The parents had not told them. Right. The parents had not told them. And, you know, it's no good just blaming society if we think that our schools are in a mess. Are we, as parents, actually teaching our children, delivering the next generation? Because if we're not, we will lose the things of God in one generation. And, and, and of course, this is a long time ago, but I think it's one of the most contemporary th issues in the church today is that absolutely the, the great failing of my generation of the church is that we failed to win the next generation. That's right. Yeah. And I think that's the, it's at a crisis point. I see it in the United States. I see it in the United Kingdom. We've already lost this and we need to start to think it through and bring it back. Paul, we have to take a break, but we want to come back and talk about the implications of this. So don't you go away. We'll be right back. We are back with Paul Taylor and we're talking about truth, lies, and science education. I just want to say to you, you know, as a pastor, our church has spent the last year talking about what are the objectives for the church. And our third objective as a church, the first one is win the loss, the second one is help the hurting. The third one is to impact the next generation. And if yeah. we don't take that seriously and if we aren't deliberative in that, um, I fear for the church. Uh, how do we do that in the area of science? Well, I mean, science cannot be uh, divorced from other types of education. The point right. is that so many people think it is. Right. Um, you know, even Christian writers have said so. Um, uh, Dennis Alexander, for example, who's a university professor in biology in England, uh, writes for the Biologus organization here in the United States and is an elder in a large evangelical church back in England. And he says it's been a long-standing tradition that scientific researchers do not mention God in their research. And he goes back to Thomas Aquinas on that issue. And it's interesting because when I've read about Thomas Aquinas, it's often been from the point of view of what Francis Schaeffer write, wrote about him, because Francis Schaeffer criticized Aquinas and, uh, in, in um, his book, How Should We Then Live? Uh, because Aquinas talks about separation between grace and nature. Grace is therefore everything to do with God, but nature is where we include science. And so that's got nothing to do with God. We should just concentrate on that and leave God out of that. Well, it's a terrible thing to do because, as I've said, the science teacher in teaching science is going to be teaching morality. But what, what actually is science? If we're teaching science, what actually is it? Now, uh, I've looked through a number of documents. This document is taken from the State of Washington education document. You can find this on the internet. Uh, so I put the page reference there. You look for their uh, kindergarten to, year, uh, to grade 12 uh, science document, page 84. They define science as a human endeavor that involves logical reasoning and creativity and entails the testing, revision, and occasional discarding of theories as new evidence comes to light. 
Now, I'm happy with that. I think that's a pretty good definition. Uh, I, I could easily bring up definitions from, uh, I've, I've done a fair amount of research on the state of Washington, on the uh, state of Oregon, on Florida, and of course uh, a wealth of knowledge on uh, uh, England and on Wales, two different constituent parts of the United Kingdom. I could find similar statements. And I think it's fair. This is what science is about. It's pretty generic, yeah. It's certainly a human endeavor, it's what we do, mm -hmm. and it should involve testing and revision. Right. Should do. That's what learning is. But of course, what we're picking up on, and particularly one of the main themes that you have on this show, is highlighting the theory of evolution. Because it quite often appears that the theory of evolution is not discarded when new evidence comes to light. <laughs> And this is very important because this is the theory, and children are told this all the time, that you develop a theory, once you've tested it, once you find it doesn't work, you throw it out. But in practice, that doesn't happen. I mean, do you, um, I often think of the theory of evolution as like a student car. Do you know what, a stu uh, you know what I mean by a student car? When I was a student at university, one of my, uh, we didn't have many cars in those days, okay? Most students couldn't afford cars. Uh, out of four of us living in uh, the apartment that we're in, uh, only one of us had a car. And every time something fell off the engine, he tied it on with string. And when the fender fell off, he tied it on with string. And when the trunk wouldn't close, he tied it on with string. And before long, it seemed like the whole car was tied up with string. <laughs> the theory of evolution is a student car. It's just tied together. It's tied together with string. They try and add some, when, it, when, when uh, something goes wrong with it, instead of discarding it, they tie a little bit on. We talk about chicken wire and bubble gum, you know? Yeah. Uh -huh. Here's some examples. This is actually from Florida, from their education system here. And it tells the students here that you need to know how the theory of evolution is supported by evidence from the fossil record, comparative anatomy, comparative embryology, biogeography, molecular biology, and observed evolutionary change. That's an interesting one. They need to know how evolution is supported by observed evolutionary change. I have not seen any evolutionary change. I haven't either. You know, if you're talking about evolution from molecules to mankind, yeah. I have seen no evolutionary change. And this is important because the students are being taught that it happens. They're being taught that there's evidence from the fossil record. So here's a question from the, from the Florida education system. The scientific theory of evolution is supported by different types of evidence. The diagrams below show the skeletons of two different animal species. How does comparing the skeletons of these animals provide support for the scientific theory of evolution? So you have a whale there and you have an alligator. And uh, we look at those, uh, we say that those are, are uh, skeletons, so how do they support the scientific theory of evolution? Now they've given you a multiple choice, so clearly they want to direct the children to one of these answers. And you know how multiple choice works. There's at least one of the answers that is clearly impossible, so it narrows down the choice. Right. So this is what they're asked. It provides information about organisms' habitats. Clearly it doesn't. B, it shows possible common ancestry between organisms. Let's go back to that. It provides information to determine organisms' ages. No, it doesn't. We can't say anything about the ages from the skeletons. Very important. It shows possible chromosomal difference, uh, similarities between organisms. Well, in fact, the one they're directing you to, of course, is B. Yes. They're saying that the fact that you've got similar structures, for example, the fact that you've got five bones in the hand of the front, front feet of the alligator, and you also have in the fin of the whale, that is being given as evidence that evolution is true. And the point is, the students need to know that that is logically unsound. It doesn't work. It is, but when a child is taking this test, he's not looking for logic. He's no. looking to get a right answer to get a good grade. That's right. So he's asking the question, which answer do they want? Yes. And by the way, my advice to young people in this particular situation is you can leave the arguments till later. Your mission field is not your professor. That's your right. mission field is not your teacher. That's and right. if you have a conscience about it, then uh, start your answers with the three words some scientists say. Yes. <laughs> you know, if you don't want to say, I believe this, then say some scientists say, because that's the truth. Some scientists do say that this shows possible common ancestry between organisms. The that's fact really is, advice, those scientists sir. are wrong. You good know, your advice, commission yeah. field for most students is your peer group. Yes. And you can get into all sorts of trouble if you try and argue the point with the teacher. It's not a good idea and I That's don't right. recommend it. But it's illogical because it's like saying, um, when it rains, the streets are wet. The streets are wet, therefore it's raining. That's not true. Yeah. Because clearly there could be another reason why the streets are wet. 
Another reason why the streets are wet is that there might be a burst water main. That's right. In the same way, although if evolution were true, you would get similar systems, the point is evolution is not true. And there are other reasons why you might have similar systems. The most obvious one being that these creatures were designed by the same designer. Absolutely, common design. And, and the only true word in there is possible. Uh, it, it, it doesn't, even that doesn't say it's, it's true, it just says it's possible. So That's you right. haven't really proven anything here. Well, I mean, God willing, we'll be talking again on another occasion about the use of the word possibly, you know, yes. how language can sometimes get right. used. But this is, this is very important that students are aware of these uh, issues. Um, here's another example from, uh, you know, Washington State uh, is saying that uh, fossil record and anatomical molecular similarities observed among diverse species of living organisms provides evidence of biological evolution. And one of the common examples that they like to give is what happened to horses. So they say that uh, according to fossil records, the horses that lived 50 million years ago were much smaller, weaker and slower than modern horses. Which process is most likely responsible for the changes that have led to the increased size, strength and speed in horses? And so they say that they, uh, you know, the one that they're looking at here, the, one, the answer that they're trying to drive them towards is that the most likely responsible change is evolution by natural selection. Yes. Now that's important and I just need to uh, show you this uh, particular diagram here which is very common. This particular diagram shows you uh, the um, supposed evolution of a horse. You start at the bottom of the diagram there and you see that the horse uh, over a period of time, or their concept of millions of years, the horse is supposed to be getting bigger and bigger as you look at that arrow going up the, uh, uh, up the diagram because eventually you reach there at the top a horse that is exactly 1.6 metres high. So you're getting gradually bigger and bigger until you get exactly 1.6 metres high. As you know, all horses, all horses today are exactly 1.6 metres high. Isn't that ridiculous? Oh, uh, no, they no, don't seem to be, do the they? The little guy didn't get the memo. No, no neither did the big guy, because he's more than 1.6 okay. metres high. And this is, you know, where, where there, is, uh, there is a certain amount of lying going on, if you like, if we dare say that, because they're being misled. Yeah. For a start, those fossils that the horse is supposed to have evolved from are probably not horses anyway. <laughs> right. Secondly, they're only arranged in that order to, to show uh, what they think is the outcome anyway, which is circular reasoning. They're arranging that in that order only because they believe the theory of evolution. Thirdly, they're achieving a, an end, which is an average size horse of 1.6 meters, but horses are not even average sizes in that way. Uh, it's, it's incredible it's, diversity in size of horses. What I ne we need to understand here is what we're talking about at the beginning of the program, because there is a message being put across here that you can ignore the facts. You just need to follow the system. That's right. So the message that's being put across here is not actual science. You see, just by looking at this photograph, the students should be able to say, well, clearly your sequence of the theory of evolution of horses is wrong. And by the way, even many evolutionary scientists don't like that particular model these days. Niles Eldridge, who used to be the curator of the Smithsonian uh, Museum, actually called this, but that particular sequence of horses gradually getting bigger and bigger, he called that sequence lamentable and said it should never be used in textbooks. But now, you'll find it in every textbook. What you have just demonstrated for us is good critical thinking. Yes. which is what our children ought to be learning to do. Absolutely right. But the, the process here is evolution's the bus we're all going to ride, and you need to learn to get on the bus, so here's the right answer. That's so right. what do we do about this, Paul? I think that this is where the debriefing around your family dinner table needs to take place. Right. That's or maybe where you learn to critically think. Exactly. And you, as parents, if your children are in public schools, then you need to be involved in their education. This is not to say that I think you need to go storming into the school and criticizing the teacher in front of them. I'm simply saying you need to be involved. Your educational impact on your children should be more important than that of uh, the teachers. If, if a parent were doing what you just did for us, uh, the critical thinking part of this, actually their education could, become, uh, could be a good thing because they learn to respond to it and to react to it and to stand on their own. Uh, you've done us a great service, and I hope our parents out there are hearing you 
in the area of responsibility and the area of involvement, especially in the science of their education. And I like what you're saying about don't attack the school. Learn how to use that in a way that it brings a godly conclusion. Absolutely. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. My friends, I hope you've been listening to some very good advice today. You know, we aren't here to just be at war with the system. And we can impact the system, and even in the system, we can teach our children to think and to think godly thoughts. Take your responsibility as a parent seriously. Be involved in the life of your child and in the education of your child. Learn to ask good questions. Learn to go over the material with them, and you'll be surprised how the worldview that God holds, that He's made us and that, he's in, that He is over us and that we are accountable to Him. That'll become your worldview and not only yours, but your child's as well. God bless you, my friend. We'll see you again soon here on Origins. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file from our website at originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program, number 1605, Cornerstone Network, Well, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.